What does authorship order mean on publications? Stick around and find out today on Navigating Academia. What's up everybody? My name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh. I want to sincerely welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do like and share this video with your students, with your colleagues, and with your friends. Subscribe to our channel, hit that bell so you get notifications when new videos are released, and comment below. I would really love to hear from you any of your thoughts on this or any of the other videos in this series. You can follow me down here at the social media accounts below. So let's jump right in, guys. Today we're going to be discussing what the order in which authors are listed on a peer-reviewed publication, what that means in practice. Is there a reason to the rhyme? You know, what's going on here? Uh, a lot of the times when you first start in academia and you end up seeing kind of this list of authors, and it could be anywhere from one author to, I was on a publication with 18 authors, and I was number 17 out of 18. And this was my first actual paper. Uh, it was a behavioral genetics paper uh, done with some colleagues who I still very dearly love at Yale uh, and it was an amazing experience for me to learn so much but in terms of author order I, I was the worst possible uh, place on the paper as it were but to be fair I also made the least significant contribution so that's pretty fair but at the end of the day what we're gonna be talking about here uh, really varies depending on the field that you're in number one uh, so for example in let's say medicine it could be totally different than in literature let's say number two is modality so people Peer-reviewed papers have really different rules than if you're dealing with something like you're writing a book chapter, let alone writing a full book. Uh, you know, these, uh, you know, the reasons behind why authors are listed in a given order can totally change based on that. And number three is the country in which you are working uh, or the country in which, let's say you're a grad student, for example, you know, you're, you're publishing your work and let's say that you're doing it in the UK and you're publishing in a British journal. It, it could be totally different in terms of the rules relative to, let's say that you're in the States or you're in Australia or any of these other English speaking countries, let alone if you're publishing in a different language. So for example, my work's been published in a variety of different languages, everything from you know Danish to Dutch, I've got work in German, I've got work in so many different languages, and you know, because of that, authorship order can really vary in terms of its practical meaning. So please do take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. I'm just gonna be telling you about my personal experience, which is in the field of medicine and behavioral health. Uh, so if it's not the case, in terms of your field, that's totally fair. But within this field, I can tell you that this is the case in terms of across the board. So let's kick it off with the first author. The first author, basically, this is their baby. They would have come up with the idea for the paper, and if they didn't come up with the idea, they've really nurtured it along the way. Uh, they should have written the majority of the paper. Now, it is the case that, let's say you're working with the statistician, maybe they wrote the method section, maybe they wrote you know, parts of the results, maybe they you know, drafted the tables or the figures, or they helped with appendices, uh, but at the end of the day, it's something where the first author is the one who uh, essentially is putting themselves on the line more than any other author on the paper. Usually they're also what's called the corresponding author. Uh, whenever you have somebody publishing a peer-reviewed paper, someone has to take responsibility for corresponding with other people. This could be because they want a copy of the paper, maybe they have questions, maybe they'd like to take a look at the data set. Uh, if you're in a science, maybe it's something where, let's say that you're in literature, they want to contact you to be able to ask questions about your piece, or maybe collaborate with you in the future, which would be awesome, right? To be able to even get asked to collaborate, it's really an honor. Uh, but regardless, of why they want to contact you, somebody needs to take responsibility for that. Now it's usually something where you're not going to get a ton of messages about something, but it is important that at least one individual on the paper says, you know what, I'll bite the bullet on this one. And usually it's either the first author 
or the last author. I have seen some papers where there are multiple authors listed in terms of being corresponding authors, but the average peer-reviewed journal requires at least one individual to be able to take on that role and to be able to have their information, which is usually their best telephone number, uh, in some cases their email address, these days very often their email address. Um, <laughs> one journal I saw fax number, people usually don't fax these days, but it happens, right? And also some kind of a mailing address. Uh, and usually you would put this information for your university affiliation. If you're not at a university, maybe you're at an institution, a government agency, let's say, wherever your office is located. Uh, I don't recommend putting your personal address on there for obvious reasons. But if it's something where you only have a home office, then, you know, that's fair enough. If you don't have a P.O. box, which would be advisable in this kind of a situation if you don't have an office of any kind. The second author can play a lot of roles, but what I have found more often than not is the second author is what I refer to as the gopher. Uh, I have been the gopher on many studies, uh, so this is not demeaning in any way, shape, or form. Uh, when I say the gopher, this means that somebody who is doing a ton of practical work. So for example, let's say that the first author or the statistician who's working on your piece, they say, listen, you know, you, you really need to conduct such and such analyses. The statistician sets it up. The first author, you know, developed the hypotheses or has kind of laid out this is what we need done or told you how to do the analyses and then you're the one who actually goes and does them. Or the statistician comes up with the findings, you've got to build the tables or you've got, let's say, for the actual manuscript, you need to make sure that it conforms to instructions for authors. Uh, you need to, for that journal, you need to make sure that, you know, actually going through the whole thing, you'll be expected to do a lot of copy editing, make sure the references all make sense, make sure there's no parenthetical references that aren't in the reference section and vice versa. Uh, you're the gopher, right? Uh, oftentimes people think, well, isn't that the first author's responsibility? Uh, and I would agree that the first author really needs to kind of take the helm and be looking for these things as well. But if they're incredibly busy or it's something where, you know, you and your supervisor have been working on a series of papers and, you know, you're a graduate student or you're a postdoc and this is your postdoctoral supervisor, that's fair enough uh, that obviously they'll have a couple of the papers where they're kind of taking the lead. And even though they're taking the lead, you're still the graduate student or the postdoc, and this is something that you'll be expected to do. Uh, for better or worse, right, it's kind of, you know, earning your keep, as it were, kind of, you know, earning your, your lashes, some may say. Uh, and that's fair enough. You really do need practice if you're an early career professional doing something like this. Um, obviously, you know, the, the higher up you get in academia, it'll be the case where the likelihood that you being a second author, you're not going to be expected to be the gopher. You know, that may be the third, the fourth, the fifth author, you know, etc. Uh, but usually you'll have at least one author on there who did a ton of work. Uh, if not, there's usually an acknowledgement section. And in the, I've been in many acknowledgement sections when I was a, a postdoc and a grad student where I wasn't an author on the paper. But, you know, I was doing favors. People would send me papers to be able to, you know, have a look at. Not in terms of peer review. This is before they submitted. They wanted my opinions. They wanted me to consult and give suggestions on statistical analysis. I did those things and I was listed as an acknowledgement. And that's fair enough. To be listed as an author, and there's usually guidelines for this depending on the field that you're in, sometimes even journals have guidelines, saying what justifies you getting authorship on the paper versus not. And you shouldn't expect that just because you give a little bit of advice, etc., that you're going to be an author on that paper. Uh, and obviously, not only a paper, but let's say that you give a lot of guidance on something that, you know, arguably is a larger project, something like a book, for instance. Uh, don't expect that just because, you know, you give assistance in these things that you're going to be an author on the book. Again, acknowledgement section, for sure, that would be the right thing to do. But even that sometimes you don't end up getting. Uh, but at the end of the day, think about all the different reasons why you would you would help or why you would play that kind of a role um, if you do. But you know, generally speaking, you know this is the reason why you've got second authorship. Now it's very rare, but I have known a few situations where the second author is only second author because whoever the first author is basically poached it from them. I remember back in 2011, I was attending a conference with a lot of really senior level colleagues, uh, and this 
this was in another country, it wasn't in the States, uh, and I was really enjoying dinner, and there was an argument that kind of broke out between several people who were serving as doctoral supervisors, some saying, well, you know, I'm the doctoral supervisor, so I'm first author on everything. Uh, you know, all the work that they do doesn't matter, you know, the students doesn't matter who they are, I am the first author on those papers. And they gave several examples of papers that they essentially, you know, they weren't writing the majority of the piece, it wasn't their baby necessarily, they were more in that supervisory function, but they felt that they were giving, you know, so much in terms of the grad student, you know, being very novice that they deserve first authorship instead. So that does happen, it, it is really the exception and not the rule, it's something not to be afraid of. Uh, this is really, you know, one of the only cases where I've heard that that happened. Um, but it's important that I mention that because, uh, you know, uh, per usual, everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt and exceptions need to be appreciated. That's second author. Now we've got all the middle authors pretty much, right? Uh, these are folks who usually in terms of their contributions, they did enough in terms of making a significant enough contribution to deserve authorship, but relatively speaking, they did the least. And this is usually relative to the first, the second, and the final author, right? Uh, maybe they did something like they contributed the data set. They built the data set. Uh, and you know, you as you know, a research team decide to take that data set and do new analyses on it. Uh, but you wanted them to be involved, to give guidance, to be able to advise on the data set that they had built. You know, that usually will justify uh, co-authorship. Maybe they consulted on the design of the study. They're an expert on design. Maybe they conducted analyses or found new, new things that could have been tested, or so new hypotheses that could have been tested. Uh, there's any number of things that they could have done. Again, it needs to be considered significant enough to the paper to be able to actually get on there. But those folks in the middle, usually, you know, they're not folks who did a, a, a ton. Now, again, this is in papers. Let's say that you have editors on an edited book, for example. Um, in 2018, I put a, a book out. It's called The Handbook of Recidivism, Risk Need Assessment Tools. Uh, and I had, you know, a number of co-editors who did a phenomenal job and everybody did literally like an equal amount. Uh, and so, you know, what we ended up doing in terms of like the order uh, was largely determined in terms of, you know, who and ended up coming out on the project at what time. Uh, and so that's how we determined that. Some people would do it alphabetically. There's all kinds of ways it can be done. But I find that on those larger projects like books and all, again, it's a, it's a different set of rules relative to peer-reviewed journals. And last but certainly not least is the final author. Now again, depends on the country, the field, and the modality of publication, but usually in peer-reviewed journals, the last author actually played a pivotal role. Usually this is somebody who is really a big dog in the field, or they were the supervisor on the project. Uh, if you have somebody who is in that large role, uh, especially if they were the supervisor, it's not a bad idea to simply ask them, what they would like to be in terms of an author on the paper. Um, if it was your paper, you know, if they say first author, that w won't happen really, but you shouldn't expect that. But if they say, I'd rather be second author, that's fair enough, right? Put them in that authorship order. Some people are gonna read it like I would and say this person may have been a gopher. But again, if they're a big name, the likelihood of that is pretty low. So it'll, as you get to know the field better, know who the players are, uh, you're gonna get a better sense in terms of whether that was a supervising uh, or senior author, or if it was the case where, you know, th this was somebody who was newer, or let's say middle career, where they're still doing a ton of work, and then second authorship would make sense in kind of a different fashion, right? Now, sometimes you wanna get a big name scholar on your piece, but because it can increase the likelihood of publication, uh, and at the end of the day, you can, you know, potentially get a new mentor, or if nothing else, network with people who can provide you with opportunities in the field, uh, or if nothing else, can help you network with other big dogs in the field. Uh, and so that could be a reason to be able to include somebody on the paper. But all I'm saying here is that don't count out the last author or think that they are playing a minor role. A number of pieces that I published, I was the senior author on because I had set up a, a very large project in some cases where there were gonna be multiple publications. And I pre-specified that on those publications with uh, which other people were leading, they should be the first author, but please make me the, the senior author, so the supervising 
best-selling author, which was always in last place. So I completely understand if you're new to publishing, not realizing that the last author is not the least important author. Uh, usually it's the first to last author, like I was on that behavioral genetics piece. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. So that, in a nutshell, is what authorship order means. All right, y'all, thank you so much for watching. I want to hear from you in the comments below. Have you found this to be the case in your field? Let us know what your field is and what authorship order means there. Obviously, in terms of my guidance, especially on this particular video, it can really change depending on where in academia you are, uh, not just geographically, but in terms of discipline. So please, let's chat about it. I know that I can learn a ton from you as well. So this will be a real pleasure to be able to have those conversations conversations in the comments below. Don't forget to like and share this video with your colleagues, with your friends, with your students. Subscribe to our channel, follow us on social media, and hit that bell so that you can get all the updates in terms of new videos that we put out. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career counseling so that we can talk about where you are in academia right now, how to build your brand, how to come up with new revenue sources for you, then let's talk. Uh, go to the website below and see one hour consultation call with me. It'll really be a pleasure to hear from you. Signing off everybody, have a great day and remember to get out there, take chances and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.